first things first, I'd like to congratulate the speakers of the first session on um, already, I think, demonstrating the value of today's workshop uh, in honour of Chris. Despite the breadth of his research, uh, Chris never worked in the Cyclades. Indeed, between his early work in the Dodecanese and the Eastern Aegean, and his subsequent work on the mainland, he seems to have rather assiduously leapfrogged uh, the archipelago. However, when uh, Robin Barber set out to recruit for a, a comprehensive study of material from the early excavations at Philacope, it was Chris, having then only recently discharged his duties as my doctoral supervisor, who provided him my name. As such, it feels entirely appropriate that I should offer a paper today um, on the subject at an event in Chris's honour. Now, as many of you will be aware, the first systematic excavations at Philacope were begun in 1896 under the aegis of the British School and the direction uh, of uh, Thomas Atkinson, Robert Bosenkay, Campbell Edgar, David Hogarth and Duncan Mackenzie. Interim reports of work conducted appeared in the second volume of, of the school annual and annually thereafter while excavations continued. The final report on the work was published in 1904. A supplementary season followed in 1911, the unpublished pottery from which has formed the topic of a recent article by Robin, with a further four excavation seasons between 1974 and 1977 led by Colin Renfrew and colleagues. This paper deals specifically with the pottery recovered between 1896 and 99. This excavation yield, yielded huge volumes of material. Edgar notes 40 or 50 basketfuls per day during the 1898 season, and on average, a day's yield of between 10,000 and 20,000 sherds during 1899. Every sherd washed and retained temporarily for quick assessment, piled high according to the location and depth at which it was recovered before, and I quote, a liberal selection was made for further study and a rough record of kept, uh, was kept of what was thrown aside. Um, Edgar's rough record on the general character of these groupings does not survive. Although he publishes a sample extract from square FG at a depth of one metre, um, in which he lists more than a hundred core sherds from pithoi with impressed bands and a number of tripod cooking pots. Mackenzie's day book also records large numbers of cooking vessels with horizontal lugs uh, from the lowest levels of the trial trench in J13. Now the square and depth at which each of these selected pieces was found was marked on the shirt in pencil. And I think you can all guess where this is going. These marks survive uh, only rarely on the course material and only in exceptional cases are they legible. Various techniques have been utilized in a desperate attempt to try and read these markings. And image manipulation in Photoshop, which is just a fancy way of pl saying played around with the curve until I saw something, has yielded some results. You can see, for example, that the square N at a depth of 350 on this cooking pot fragment here. Um, however, most of these sherds are without context. The course assemblage stored today in the National Archeo Archaeological Museum consists of around 650 catalogue pieces, a very low number when you consider the daily yields of 10 to 20,000 sherds, among which are a small number of intact vessels and others for which joins have been identified over the course of the current project. Many, however, are relatively small body sherds, some in rather poor condition, which have proved difficult to assign to particular shapes. Fabric analysis may offer uh, some resolution um, in, in a limited number of cases, although the study of the material remains ongoing. Uh, the material is exceptionally wide ranging in both its uh, apparent date and in terms of the shapes included and the um, influences represented. Um, I had 
initially thought about presenting a summary version of the entire assemblage, um, but there were too many problematic shards, I think, to really make that viable. And so what I offer today instead is some very preliminary observations on the cooking vessels from the excavation. Now, cooking vessels, um, as I'm sure we're all aware, offer a valuable resource with which to explore shifts in prehistoric foodways and the role of food um, in social negotiation, a subject that Chris himself explored in his 2007 volume co-authored with Gisette Renard, Cooking Up the Past. And with an ever-expanding petrographic database, fabric analysis continues to elucidate these socio-economic networks, um, through which ceramic and culinary technologies, as well as finished objects, circulated. Unfortunately, coarse pottery, and particularly cooking vessels in the Cyclades, remain desperately understudied. And the identification of particular cooking shapes is heavily reliant on the identification of Minoan and Mycenaean parallels. Contemporary indigenous Middle Bronze to Late Bronze Cycladic types remain poorly represented in comparison. In the absence of contextual data, Philacop is ultimately reliant on the excavation and publication of parallels from other Cycladic sites. And so the following summary does little to further the local Middle Bronze, Late Bronze typology. Nevertheless, several interesting details have emerged from the study of the assemblage to date. Shock horror. <laughs> of all the various kitchen shapes, tripod cooking pots are undoubtedly the most easily recognizable and thus the most numerous. There are at least 30 fragments which certainly or probably belong to tripod cooking bowls. Uh, among the 96 to 99 assemblage. This can hardly reflect their ubiquity during the excavation, although the visibility of diagnostic sherds among the mounds noted by Edgar may also have resulted in an overrepresentation relative to non minoanizing shapes. Most are identified by their disembodied legs, of course which are often, although not exclusively, ovoid in section and which range significantly in their widths and heights. Whether or not such differences can be equated with differences in the use of the vessel and by extension, their association uh, with particular food types remains unclear. Such variation makes it extremely difficult to date closely within the middle bronze, late bronze age bracket although several legs that preserve the beginnings of flat bases are likely related to Betancourt's middle Minoan type B, which appears at um, Irene. And at the latter site, between periods four and seven, um, they've posited some chronological differences in rim diameter, although this is not certain. To date, no examples of tripod jugs have been identified although this may be an accident of preservation. Where the legs or scars thereof are absent, it is likely that wide mouth jars with horizontal or vertical loop handles or lugs below the rim can reasonably be identified as more of the same, particularly when burned or smoked. Where the body survives, most, as is typical, are undecorated. Although one example, which you can see here, C0430, preserves two vertical relief bands at the exterior and could perhaps be as early as early Cycladic three, although the identification is tentative. This may be slightly earlier than the appearance of the shape at Aya Irini, where it is visible by early period four and where it becomes more common during the late phase 4C, in line with a more general increase in the visibility of Cretan drinking and pouring vessels. Similar diagnostic pieces and one largely intact vessel are noted among the middle Cycladic and late Cycladic one material from the 74 to 77 excavation, while two almost complete LH3 shapes, uh, examples, excuse me, have been published by Penelope Mountjoy. Given the similarity in shape and, uh, in shape and fabric to the latter, C0617 may also be LH3C in date, although I welcome any um, feedback on that. Petrographic analysis indicates that, as are other contemporary sites, many of these vessels were manufactured locally. 
However, there is at least one uh, import from elsewhere in the archipelago, which is C0207 here, um, which may derive from western Naxos, although similar fabrics are also seen on Paros and Mykonos. Other examples may have originated on Thera, although the identification is here, is here less certain, as particular recipes are adopted at particular sites through the course of the Middle and Late Bronze Age. There are also a small number which may be of Cretan manufacture. Uh, C0484 appears to be Middle Minoan, uh, while C0175 and 2013 may also prove to be, the latter particularly based on the use of ground shale temper, and I have Sandy McGillivray to thank for the identification. Tripod vessels of this sort are normally considered to be Minoanizing rather than Minoan, although these few sherds attest to the movement of at least some genuine Cretan cooking vessels into the site. Equally interesting is the identification of a tripod leg, uh, C0211, which um, appears to be manufactured in a local clay, but which is nevertheless pierced through its thickness to aid firing to the core, a technique also visible on Crete. At the very least, we might take this to infer with caution manufactured by Emilian Potter, at least familiar with Cretan production techniques, at most, and almost certainly overextending the evidence, uh, we might take it to infer the presence of a Cretan potter using local clays to manufacture shapes with which they were already familiar. The presence of uh, Minoan craftsmen at Felaka P during the Middle and Late Bronze Age has already been inferred based on the introduction from Crete of the potter's wheel during the later Middle Bronze, early Late Bronze, and in the shift to the use of the warp-weighted loom represented by Minoan-type discoid loom weights, including half-discoid types from the 1911 excavation, which are more specifically associated with the Messera. Although not visible at all uh, within the original excavation report, Rees' study has also yielded a handful of fragments of mainline, mainland excuse me, type griddles of probable LH3 A to B date. The shape is characterized by the presence of numerous shallow holes, none of which pierce the full depth of the base. The normal ori orientation of the vessel seems to have had these perforations facing upwards. The well-smoothed underside, which you can see on this example, um, now thought, uh, once thought to be a functional surface, now explained by the need to reseal the clay after piercing to prevent the vessel being weakened. Residue analysis on an example from Medea has identified both cereal and oil, and the holes have recently pro been proposed by um, Hubri, and I hope I'm pronouncing the name right, uh, as wells in which oil might pool and heat. This would have prevented food, and specifically breads, as these griddles seem to have been used for, from sticking. Hubri, um, again, who has undertaken experimental research with reconstructions, has suggested that they may be better suited to thick glutinous doughs rather than thinner varieties. Most of the sherds from the 96 to 99 assemblage derive from the centre of the base and so by default are identified with the basic low wall type. CO74 by contrast appears to be of the high walled variant. The functional difference between the two types is not clear Although, again, Hubri's analysis has led her to conclude that high-walled examples may have been better suited for use in exposed locations to prevent ash being blown across the food. Thus, what we may be looking at is a distinction between indoor and outdoor types. Both CO73 and CO74 are of a non-calcareous volcanic fabric. CO73 was probably manufactured locally on Milos, as indicated by the presence of phyllite inclusions, although CO74 may very well be an import from Egina, suggesting that coarse vessels arrived at Philakopy with those better attested decorated mainland imports. A small assemblage of, important, of imported cooking vessels from Egina have also been noted at Aya Irini, although griddle pans do not seem to be represented among them. 
Again, the data set is too small to confidently infer much about those using the objects. The shape has been identified with elite dining practices on the mainland, but whether or not these vessels can be associated with an elite group at Filaka P, able to access genuine imports, and a lower order group reliant on the local manufacture of mycenaeanizing shapes is currently impossible to determine. Ultimately, while such differences may have been salient, it may well have been the use context of these objects, which was of greater social significance. The practice of dining mainland style, rather than the origin of the pottery used, and a potentially informative parallel exists in the presence of both imported craters and locally manufactured kylikes within an LC3B1 drinking assemblage from the 74 to 77 excavation. So, in addition to the baking of flatbreads, we do have some limited evidence for the grilling of meat. Come, this comes in the form of two spit supports published in the original excavation report, which have not been located during the recent study, although they have previously been assigned by Sheffer to her type A, which is distinguished by the presence of holes rather than handles to allow the supports to be lifted out of the coals. Like the griddle, spit supports have been considered objects for use at special commensal events rather than objects for everyday use. Examples are known at Late Minoan 1A Akrotiri and Aya Irini, and the Felaka P example should also be late middle Cycladic, early late Cycladic in date. Currently, there are no definite examples within the 1896 to 99 course assemblage of the more developed version of the spit support the so-called souvlaki trays which appear alongside griddles on the late Hellenic mainland. There is, however, and I'm going out on a limb here, so bear with me. There is, however, one core shared, CO526, with a low squared leg, deeply slashed at the exterior, a flat base and vertical walls which could potentially represent a vessel with a similar function. Burning on the upper side rather than the underside does something to strengthen the identification, although it's still unclear and someone here may be able to provide an alternative interpretation. Cooking pots are largely identified by traces of burning at the exterior and vary significantly in the thickness of their walls, their profile and the height and diameter of their bases. The latter including both flat and raised variants as well as in the number and position of their handles, most of them thick, ovoid and vertical rather than horizontal. Given the apparent absence of close Cretan parallels, it is likely that many represent distinctly Cycladic, i.e. non-Minoanizing shapes. Distinctions are likely to be at least partly chronological and or aesthetic, although again, it is possible that variation in form reflects the different cooking requirements of particular meals and or the cooking facilities available in particular contexts. There are uh, an approximate minimum of 25 cooking pots represented among the 1896 to 99 material, while several additional LH3C flat-based cooking pot forms are published by Penelope Mountjoy from within the 1974 to 77 assemblage. Many appear to be local products. Only one definite import has been identified so far the central piece on the PowerPoint, CO192, which is manufactured in a metamorphic schist fabric and which probably comes from somewhere in the so-called Western string, perhaps Aya Irini or Sifnos. Um, as has been noted for mainland cooking jars, it's likely that the narrow base diameter of many of these probable cooking pots would have made them unable to stand unsupported or at best extremely unstable, suggesting either that they were supported in the fire by the piling up of coals around them or by some form of support. There is only one shirt among the assemblage which may represent, and I, I again uh, suggest with caution, uh, may represent some form of support, although the identification, as I say, is tentative and its exterior surface rather than the interior, appears to show the best evidence of being affected by heat. 
Several baking pans are noted, which uh, range in diameter between 30 to 60 centimeters, and include examples with both rough and well-smoothed bases, a uh, characteristic normally taken to distinguish between those on tripod legs and those placed directly onto the coals. Based on parallels from Irene, it's likely that the most belong to the Middle Bronze Age, although one red slipped and burnished hearth or pan on a raised conical base with parallels at both Acrotiri and Dascalio should be early Bronze Age in date, Dascalio face C. One example from the 1896 to 99 assemblage, CO93, sits on a raised base. Its identification as a cooking pan is confirmed by the president presence of very heavy burning on its underside, although I have yet to identify a parallel, so again, invite suggestions. Another very tall tripod pan, C0561, perhaps 30 centimeters high originally, is actually referred to unusually within the 1904 volume, where it's described as a large table. The base itself is not burned, although there are clear signs of smoking on both the underside and the interior of the legs. No certain examples of Minoan or Minoanizing baking dishes have been identified to date. Although there is one possible example from the 74 to 77 excavation, and among the 1896 to 99 material, there are a small number of wide, shallow vessels, including some with traces of burning, which may have served a similar function. Interestingly, no utensils, ladles, or dippers have been identified among the 86, uh, 96 to 99 material. Although numerous fragments of small ladles of probable late cycladic one date are noted in the 1904 report. Decorated at the interior with rosette motifs, there is one additional example from the 74 to 77 excavation. Given the identification of so many decorated examples, it's difficult to believe that an undecorated example would not have been retained if identified. There is one tripod pot which preserves use wear indicative of the presence of ladles, although the absence of coarse variants uh, is currently difficult to explain. A coarse scoop is attested, although it's more likely connected with the movement of coals rather than the direct preparation of food. I'm afraid that's all you're getting in terms of pictures of pottery. So, having already confidently over-inferred <laughs> Uh, from the material presented. How can I extend that over inference? Well, for now, it is not possible to trace in detail chronological variation in the appearance of, and disappearance, excuse me, of course, Minoanizing shapes at Philakopi. Although the presence of imported Cre Cretan cooking vessels offer, offers a further perspective on the movement and acculturation of Minoan groups within the Cycladic archipelago. Similarly, so the appearance of the mainland type griddle, either as an indicator of the presence of mainland groups or as a way in which local groups might distinguish themselves through conspicuous consumption in the mainland style. Both observations suggest that the paraphernalia of cooking and no doubt also the act of cooking itself, especially if carried out in public view, as well as the recipes employed represented a potentially significant facet in identity negotiation at Philakopi, either by incoming groups who wished to maintain their own cultural traditions, or by local groups who chose to adopt ostensibly foreign culinary practices. The reality may well be more complex, perhaps involving the deployment of Cretan or mainland practices only at specific times or in specific contexts, perhaps alongside decorated pottery types and other forms of material culture. Unfortunately, this is something which, for now, the coarse material doesn't allow us to distinguish. How local vessels and recipes were deployed during the early Bronze Age, and subsequently alongside other Minoan or Mycenaean shapes, is not yet clear. The proceeding very much represents a work in progress, and the continued studies of those ostensibly local cooking pots within the 1890s six to 99 assemblage, as well as the continued publication of course groups from other Cycladic sites, 
may well yield additional insight. Thank you very much.